Hello, it's Lauren King on again, Inspiring Entrepreneurs, and today I am welcoming Megan DiMartino, who is an author, has um, two multi-million dollar businesses, um, and a wonderful story to tell. I can't wait to hear Megan tell her story herself today. So Megan, please introduce yourself to our listeners, viewers, readers. <laughs> Well, hello, and thank you, Lauren, for inviting me to join your uh, tribe. Uh, as I shared with you, these are my people, you know, mompreneurs. It's uh, truly in my heart. I'm a New York girl, New York City, uh, deep in the heart of Texas, with a serving, mentoring heart. And as Lauren shared, I have I've been busy over the last 28 years, building several businesses uh, that really integrate together. But it doesn't just happen. You know, this, this, the information is in the story, as we know, you know, it because we, I was a single parent, uh, most all of my uh, life, my adult life, and certainly um, building uh, businesses. But before I started my first entrepreneurial business, I was in business, so to speak, I have always worked from the time I was, you know, from college. And so it's just an evolution of all of that. So that's what I'd like to share today to give people, and as Lauren uh, mentioned, I uh, published a book in December and it went to, on Amazon and it went to number one on January 4th. And so in that story, and the title is Hope and Possibilities Just Over the Horizon, It's Never Too Early, guys, and it's never too late to create the life of your dreams. So that is, in a nutshell, who I am. Oh, that's lovely, Megan. I loved reading your book and reading your story. And there were a lot of things I got out of it. And one of them that fascinated me because my mom did this as well. My mom's also a serial entrepreneur like you. And one of the things you did was you sold Tupperware. So tell us about your Tupperware experience. <laughs> Well, that actually is a very pivotal story to my story because it really encompasses several things. Prior to Tupperware, though, just quickly, I went to uh, college for fashion merchandising and I worked in Manhattan in the uh, buyer's training program in Lord & Taylor. Then I went to Bloomingdale's in their buying office of cosmetics. And during that time in the buying office of cosmetics, they brought in a line from London called Biba. Now Biba was a very uh, pivotal, cool chick in Carnaby Street in the 60s. And she had a, a really amazing store, clothing, but and cosmetics. And they uh, cut it, Bloomies cut a deal with Biba to bring the cosmetics into the Bloomingdale stores, but to market it in the junior department. So because I was a young woman, uh, they said, would you have any interest in being a co-manager of this stand, so to speak, that was in the junior department. And I went, wow, yes. And so I was uh, trained by the makeup artist from Biba. And one day in that, uh, in the junior department of Bloomingdale's, uh, listening to Don McLean's Bye Bye American Pie, um, uh, blaring on the, you know, the stereo there, I said, someday I'm going to do this. And this meant to me, create. It didn't mean start my own business. And this was probably 74. And I said, someday I'm going to do this, like create something. So that was in my spirit. So then the next year I um, was pregnant and had a child. And so I could not work and did not work. The other dynamic that happened is we moved to uh, rural Connecticut and uh, outside of, you know, connecting to any of what I just shared. And we were 15 miles from the downtown of this little New England town. And we had one car. My husband worked for IBM and he was in a carpool. So there were days I had a car, but not consistently to work. So I was, you know, out of luck. And so I played tennis to stay sane. And one day at the tennis courts, so girlfriends would pick me up, we'd go to the tennis court with the kids and I would play tennis with everybody. 
And so one day there was a group of women over under the tennis hut and I walked over to see what was going on and it was a Tupperware party. Now this is 1976 and I had no, I mean, I had heard of Tupperware but not, did not really know Tupperware. Um, Johnny Carson, the late night guy used to make fun of Tupperware but other than that, really <laughs> didn't know Tupperware. And so I asked this woman though, because remember, I needed money and I needed a car. But I asked this woman, what did she make doing this? And I knew her and uh, she said, oh, I'll have my manager call you. So the manager called me, came over to my home. I can see this like it was yesterday, sitting at my kitchen table. And she went through the whole pitch, you know, you become a sales person, you purchase a kit, I have consistent parties. And then she mentioned that managers like she got Ford LTD station wagons, like the one in my driveway. <laughs> and I said to her, oh, please tell me about how you do that. And she looked at me like very patronizingly and said, well, dear, you know, you just you get your kit and get going and you'll learn about that. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not interested. And in, I remember saying this to her, I'm not interested really in selling plastic bowls, but I am interested in that car. So my why was the car. And so <laughs> she uh, then went, okay, well, again, you buy your kit, you because, you know, we start doing parties, have consistent sales, recruit six people. Six people, I said, that's it. And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, I will do this. So I put together the $40, which was a lot of money to me at that moment mm. uh, to get the kit. And, but from the moment I said yes to this gal, uh, her name was Nancy, I remember that. And uh, the, from that moment, I started recruiting people. And within six months, I was a manager of my unit, as they were called, the megaphones. <laughs> and the important point to this story also is that I also had, so remember the creative, someday I'm going to do this, create. Mm. So that I've always known I was creative because I went to college for fashion merchandising. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to do, you know, design actually, but but uh, this experience, Lauren, really defined my purpose because the megaphones were not the largest unit by numbers of people working in the unit, but we were always in the top four of money producing units. And that was because I recruited, if you wanna use that word, uh, individuals that were uh, solid that they were really, interest, really interested in uh, doing something. And I, re I realized at a very young age and doing something meaning their why, whatever that was, but producing you know, money to help that why. And so I learned at a very young age that you don't build a business, you build a team and the team builds the business. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with these women to help them be successful. And so it really helped me throughout my career, having defined that, that um, it was then with these other um, entrepreneurial ventures that I did personally, that it was not just me, it was building around it mm -hmm. with individuals. How long did it take you to get your car? Six months. Oh, in six months. months. Six wow. months. That's, That's what I said. Amazing. From that moment, that I said, yes, I started recruiting people. So you just and had to become a manager to get the car. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Okay. Right. And, and so it was a very, uh, it was a really great experience and least of which was the product, honestly, least of which was the product. I could not sell anything and I'll speak about selling in a minute but I could not sell anything I didn't believe in. Mm. Obviously I got to know the product mm. and obviously the product worked, mm. but it really was interfacing with uh, people and, and building relationships with hostesses. Hostesses would have many multiple parties. 
through those parties. I've met people that always listen to people, what they were looking for. And if people like myself who asked that woman, what did you make? I then, you know, if somebody was saying things like that, say, let's get together. And so, you know, I built this unit. No, but it only took six months wow. to put that together. Yes. And I was with them for about three years. And uh, I, and it was a great, as I said, it was a great experience because it was, a, um, and it still is, you know, in business, they're doing a lot of virtual, doing, you know, uh, business very differently, but uh, it was a very well-run company. And I learned so much about marketing from them. So much of what I do today came from Tupperware, uh, meaning from the marketing standpoint. So it was a great experience. Uh, working, but also defining, you know, that goal, doing that goal, you know, accomplishing the goal, and then building from there. Stunning, absolutely amazing. And you went on after that to, um, was it Glycolic next? Not, no, not yet. Like no, not, no, not, no, not, not yet. Glycolic was 92. <laughs> uh, what really happened next, ladies, is that um, I was in a marriage that really shouldn't have been. And it really talks about that in my book, correct, Lauren? Meaning that the, the person I married, yes. I really married my mother-in-law as that book shares. And um, I, she was one of my mentors. It's a long story. And I have a free gift for you at the end. We'll talk about that. But uh, the, uh, so I knew that I needed to make that change. It was just not a healthy situation for me. And it was not a healthy situation for my daughters. And so I uh, knew that I could not <clears throat> work the pace I was working at, meaning being a mom and, and managing all of that and doing all of these parties and working with my team. So I uh, called a girlfriend of mine and said, um, would you drive down to Darien, which is where the distributor was? And I brought my car back. And I never forget bringing that, the keys in and putting them on the desk of the um, distributor. You know, it was a husband and wife team. And he looked at me like, what are you doing? And I said, Larry, and I just have to take care of me and my life. And so um, I, for the next couple of years, I uh, worked on getting divorced. And so I divorced. And during that season, I did some... Uh, at sales jobs, mainly advertising space sales locally. And, um, and then in 1983, I did something that was probably one of the most difficult things in my life, but it was one of the most important things I did in my life, which was I moved to uh, the Eastern end of Long Island. Now you, you have listeners all over the world, but Long Island is long. And it starts, you know, right, the bridges from Manhattan over to the boroughs, as, as it's called, meaning Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and then out to Long Island. And so I moved my family out to the way eastern end of Long Island to take a job with my family, my family's paper company. And, and that I speak about that in the book. Mm -hmm. And, but that was such a important thing to do because, meaning why I say it was difficult to leave Connecticut because I had so many very deep, strong friendships of women that bolstered each other up. And our children were all very, it was a tribe, you know, we were all very, very close. Mm -hmm. And so to leave that network was very difficult. But I had been, um, I, after I stabilized a bit, I took a job with a marketing company in Manhattan, and I was uh, working on different advertising sales jobs, projects, and I loved it, but it was commuting to Manhattan, and it was not the right thing for my children. So um, I then, my dad, in this period of time, kept calling me saying, join us, we want to add some products to the beauty division. Now I have to explain that a teeny bit. Um, basically, my father is an entrepreneur, he, they, my parents are no longer with us, but I was brought up by a very powerful entrepreneur. And what I mean by that is 
again, entrepreneurs, everything starts from an idea, a vision, a vision, mission, and actualize it. And my father's father, my grandfather, was an Italian immigrant, came to New, uh, to New York, to uh, the U.S. when he was 16. And he came from Italy uh, with a family. So he had that pioneer spirit in him as well. And that's a long story. But he came to Manhattan and he got a job in a very high-end um, hotel in their in-house barber shop. Now, he wasn't a barber, but he was what they call a tin cup boy. So he was in training. So he mixed all the shaving cream and hence the tin cup. And, uh, but he had a you know, very magnanimous personality and people enjoyed him. So people would tend to take him under their wings and train him. So he started doing barbering and uh, loved doing the Zigfield girls because this hotel was near Times Square and where all the shows are in Manhattan. And so he um, ingratiated himself to this very wealthy man that came into Manhattan from Long Island, but close to the city. And this man set my grandfather up in business. And I don't even know if it was a loan or just did it, but he opened a barber shop, uh, which then turned into a salon years later, right by the train station uh, in this town, Freeport, Long Island, and uh, a commuting town to the city for wealthy, let's say, stockbrokers and people like that to get into the city, because this was in the 30s. So my dad and his brothers helped their father work in this barber shop. And as they were doing hair, he was doing hair services, he would do perming. And in those days, it was that, you know, um, almost like a spaceship, you know, and the ends of the perm rods were rolled with cloth. And so my father remembered this. And so after the Second World War, my father got a job because he was in the um, Air Force. After the, um, he came back, he got a job with a large paper company. And one of the products, Lauren, that he sold was wet strength tissue, basically to, for hospitals for underbedding, okay? But my father being the creative as he is or was, he said, I bet this would work for perming. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he took this tissue and cut it up and brought it to salons and his territory was basically Manhattan and around, you know, it's called the tri-state area. And um, so Connecticut, Long Island, New Jersey and so forth. So he would take, and primarily hospitals, but he would take it to salons and ask the salon owner or the manager to try this. Wow. Because by this point, they weren't using cloth anymore. They were using a product called mesh, which was a non-woven material, but they would reuse it because it was expensive. And that's, you know, not, not very sanitary. So this tissue was one-tenth the cost and disposable, so i.e. very sanitary. So he would give it to these gals. They would use it and say, I love this. This is great. So we, us children, I was one of four, were packing end papers in our basement. So that was my first job in the beauty industry. So fast forward, 70s, he develops dental and medical laboratory uh, products, uh, bite wing tabs when you have an x-ray for uh, dental, but he was a converter. He didn't own his own trees. He wasn't a, a, a paper mill like Kimberly Clark. So he was do, being very creative in what he was doing. He, was a, he became a master in sourcing of paper, of paper itself wow. and then converting it to other things. So um, now, now fast forward to the early 80s and I get divorced, I'm working in Manhattan and um, he kept calling me saying, come and work with us, come and work with us. <laughs> I want to add products to the beauty division. And he saw that I was creative. He saw what I had done. And so I finally said yes. And, I be, and the big yes was because I knew I'm talking now personal, there were reasons, you know, it was family, but the business yes part 
was that I realized I had an opportunity that I would never get again in my life where I could do R&D, figure out what the market needed. I could do R&D. I could do then determine that product, put it together, packaging, then marketing, and then take it to market and sell it. Because in that uh, his products, and this was not uncommon. Um, well, let me say it this way. In those days, there were only two channels of distribution, wholesale, and this applies to anything, wholesale and brick and mortar. That's because there was no internet. There was no website. There was, of it course. was black and white. Mm -hmm. So he sold these end wraps, of course, to wholesale beauty distributors. So the channel of, of sale was already set up. So I knew that was the end sales structure. And so I, again, I would go into salons and ask them, because I he gave me other projects to do, but uh, ostensibly I went into salons and asked them, what did they need in reference to paper? Had to be paper. And so it, this is now the early eighties, 83, 84. And I would hear from these salons, well, these girls are going to these solar nail classes and they're coming back because remember, well, I shouldn't remember uh, just to share a timeline story or point of reference. There was no such thing as the nail industry as we know it today. Acrylic nails, gels, tips didn't exist. And there was no in the United States. Now this is not applicable to Europe, but in the United States, the word spa did not e exist it was a hair salon, okay? And they didn't do skincare, did not. Now the only quote unquote spa structure that in the United States were high-end places like Elizabeth Arden's Red Door or Georgette Klinger or re resorts, things of that nature. So I would go into these salons and I would hear these women are ruining our towels because just to give you another point of reference, acrylic nails, Every company that developed acrylic nails, creative nail and on came from the dental industry because bonding teeth, powder and acrylic hardens, okay? But you have to build it up. You have that form and you build that nail up. And so you would wipe that brush off, keep wiping it on the quote unquote Terry towel or the waffle cotton towel that they used in a salon. So that bonding teeth, it would harden right? Destroying the towel. So I heard that enough, Lauren, that I went back to my dad and I said, let's look for toweling. What does it need to be? What are the properties of it? Well, it should be absorbent and lint-free. Lint-free data is the big, big deal. And so he, uh, we got many samples from different mills and tested, I uh, put testing salons together and I put together the first nail towel for the beauty industry. And I called it the table towel and packaged Wonderful. it and took it to the distributor. Well, first to the manufacturer reps, then to the distributors and on. And then I started private labeling, approaching the nail companies for them to private, uh, we to private label it for them. So I went to school on that. And then, of course, I learned a lot from that. So then during the 80s, the nail industry started to grow. The Asian nail salon hadn't happened yet, but salons started putting nail services in and some pedicures and it started, they started calling themselves full service salons. Salon still, not spa. So then I am personally smack dab in the middle of the baby boomer generation. So I kind of use me as the bellwether, meaning what I'm interested in generally is what other people are looking for. And remember I said in 1974, something creative. So paper, you know, I learned a lot, but it wasn't very exciting. And my dad was going to somewhat semi-retire and it, things were changing. And at that same season, um, and well, during that season, I should say, I was observing the nail industry, that full service salon concept, it was ripening itself to skincare or for skincare. And so uh, at that, during that season, I said to myself, I think I need to look at 
developing. Because remember, I worked in the buying office of Bloomingdale's. And so I, and I knew what I was interested in, you know, now I'm turning 40 or getting close to it, I should say. And so at that, during that season, I was recruited by Alcon Laboratories in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's what got me to Texas, ladies. Um, and the reason they recruited me or were interested in me is because they are a large pharmaceutical company, Fortune 500 company owned by Nestle. So it's an international company. But they had just, Alcon itself had just purchased a small lab uh, manufacturing hair care products, products uh, that were similar to like Rogaine or Nioxin, you know, hair scalp problems. And they wanted to repackage and reposition this line. And so hence they rec you know, recruited me. So I was the national sales and marketing director for them. Uh, and so this was in 1987. So I worked with Race and my father is Ray DiMartino and son is my brother. I worked with them from 83 to 80 through 87 and I, or early 87. I took that job and then I was at the summer of 87 moved to Fort Worth, Texas. And I have two daughters as I've shared. My older daughter was graduating from high school. So she finished high school in, you know, on Long Island. And, but the 11 year old, she had no choice. She moved to Texas with me. And uh, so we were living in Fort Worth, Texas, kind of fish out of water, but it was also another great experience. But I took that job specifically because I said, uh, by this point, I'm going to do a skincare line, but I'm not a chemist. And so by working inside that pharmaceutical company, I was privy to tremendous information. And I was able to um, get to know intimately uh, chemists, very sophisticated chemists who, because I don't, I'm not a chemist, I have a sales marketing background. And so I was able to work with them on the projects I was working with on for them, for Alcon, but I was able to learn about ingredients. And during that season, I stumbled upon glycolic acid from the alpha hydroxy fruit acid family. And I went to the head chemist and I said, tell me about uh, uh, you know, uh, glycolic acid specifically, not alpha hydroxys. And he said, oh, well, the alpha chain, the beta chain. I said, whoa, 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 you're talking to me. There was no way, uh, there was no Surrey. Hey, Surrey, tell me uh, about glycolic acid. There was no, you know, Googling so forth. And so I said, no, you're talking to me. Tell me in my, my uh, understanding why Avon, Avon, the Avon lady, other than Skin So Soft, a bug repellent, they don't market anything. It's the, the catalog and the Avon lady. But in this marketing report that I read in 19, probably uh, 89 to 90, that in 92, Avon was going to launch a single product called Anu, and it was based on glycolic acid. That's what my marketing brain said. There must be something in this glycolic acid. And that's why I went to Raymond Bollinger. And, um, and that's when I said the alpha chains, the beta chains. I said, no, no, talk to me. He went, well, it's been used for years in products for eczema and psoriasis. He goes, I guess you would say exfoliant. I said, okay, okay. That was some place to start from. And so at that point, we were working on a hair care line uh, based on hyaluronic acid, which is the tour de force of ingredients today. Very large molecule, very hydrating ingredient. But this is a 1989-90, long ago, long before its time. The reason why we were working on it is hyaluronic acid was first created to uh, uh, keep the eye moist during eye surgery. And Alcon manufactured ostensibly products for the ophthalmologist and the dermatologist, okay? And so I, we had just created a hair care line called Halyron. And I did a storyboard of a skincare line because I didn't say, I said, someday I'm going to create something. I didn't say someday I'm going to uh, be an entrepreneur and have my own business. Did not say that. So I did this storyboard for my boss on this skincare line based on hyaluronic acid. And he said, Lauren, I mean, this is so pivotal in the story. 
He said, Megan, skincare doesn't sell. Amazing. In all yeah. fairness to the man, in all fairness to the man, <clears throat> A, the baby boomer really was just getting old enough. And B, which is really A, the, there were no result-oriented medical grade, pharmaceutical grade ingredients. So there was nothing result-oriented, you see? It took glycolic acid to explode that and educate that to the consumer, that there were finally products that did something, not just an emollient that sat on the top of the epidermis. So it really, in, as I said, in all fairness to the guy, but <clears throat> I said to myself, uh-oh, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> Meaning because he didn't have that same passion. He was just going through the road he didn't have that same passion of creating. And so I said, mm, this isn't going to work. So, but I didn't quit my job because remember I said my daughter was going into college and the other one in high school. So I said, you know, I have to really take my time and think about this. But during that season is what, so when, after he said this, I started calling labs in the United States, asking them if they were doing R and D yet in glycolic acid. Many of them said to me, I have no idea what you're talking about. And several said, we're, we're going to be going into it, not yet. And I finally found one that said, yes, we are doing R&D. We're beginning R&D. So I, um, and, and luckily for me, they were in Dallas, Texas. So I, uh, yes. Oh, wow. Luckily, in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> so the stars aligned. And Happy were, coincidence. Yes. So yeah. we continued uh, speaking and, and so forth. And I then left my job because it wasn't fair for me to moonlight, so to speak, doing the same genre. And I did some consulting projects for some makeup artists and I sold Jaguars at a uh, overseas motors in Fort Worth at, as I was putting this together. And I then launched Glycolique in the summer of 1992. And that, uh, so again, there were no, it was just wholesale or brick and mortar. And wholesale was to salons. There were no spas yet. So the other very important piece to this story is that I also assisted, I'm not gonna say it was solely me, but I assisted, I was a pioneer in educating the salon how to add skincare to their businesses. And from there, the spa world evolved from there. Amazing. Okay. So with that, about, you know, not only creating the product, which shot off like a rocket because of the result oriented factor of it. But I also had worked in the industry with uh, Raisin and Alcon and saw how they marketed things. Remember I said, I've learned a lot about marketing from Tupperware, uh -huh. but it's about how you take it to market and how you present things. So I didn't just develop a whole line of, you know, let's say 10 products. I did a three-step system and I put it in an overbox. So the sales consultant going into salons would say, hey, I have this new product. So they're now used to selling hair care products uh, nail products. And now I'm introducing these mainly men, mainly men, how to sell skincare to a salon. And so we did a lot of trade shows, a lot of classes, a lot of workshops, but again, I'm one human being. And these products were sold throughout the United States through these wholesale distributors. So I built a team of women that were licensed professionals in the um, salon industry some cosm uh, here in the States, cosmetologists, so they could do hair care services, nail care services, skin care services, but most importantly, people that love the products. And I would meet those people through trade shows. They'd say, oh my gosh, I love these products. And I'd listen to them and then approach them about, you know, working in that market because the beauty industry is divided into five regions, Northeast, Southeast, Midwest, Southwest, and West. So I tried to keep it regionalized, working with the distributors and training people and building, as I said, uh, the industry, get introducing the industry to spa, to skincare, ostensibly skincare 
and then that spa concept grew. And so Glycolique was uh, my first um, seven figure business. And uh, the lab that I, um, that manufactured the products for me almost from the beginning, Lauren, um, would call me because they couldn't believe how quickly this built. And they uh, years back had tried to get into the wholesale beauty industry with a product that they developed and it failed miserably. And that's because it didn't have the relationships. Again, business is about building relationships. And I had worked in that industry for so many years, but I then came to market with something that really worked and was put together from a marketing position that assisted the, the sales consultant to sell to, and then the salon to sell the, to the consumer. So um, it, it shot off like a rocket, as I shared earlier. So almost from the beginning, they started knocking on my door. You know, I would talk to them all the time because they were manufacturing the products, but they'd say, would you like to sell us this? And, and so finally, um, I felt that because one of the things that was difficult for me, now today you can start a business with no capital. Now listen to this folks, this is a very important piece. Today you can start a business with vir virtually no capital, but to do that type of business, it was a hungry animal for capital mm. because as it grew, it needed more and more products. And I was a female and this is now, you know, uh, the nineties and <clears throat> it was not easy raising capital. Mm. And so I felt that, uh, and I liked these people. They were good people. They were creative people. They were uh, excited about what I was doing. And I felt it was a good marriage. And so I uh, built it and sold it to them. So mm -hmm. I started, I scaled, and I sold. Mm -hmm. Okay. I ran it con uh, contractually for them for two years. And then I left, I finished, you know, the contract. And I, during that season, I realized that I realized, honestly, during that season, that it was, uh, this was what I was to do in my life meaning to, to build, to begin to build and scale uh, and sustain. And uh, I realized that. And so we, mm -hmm. my chemist who I had met in the uh, lab, uh, he had by this point started his own business and he and I put together Novita Spa clinical products. And we launched that, I launched that in the summer of 1997. Okay. So this was a completely new range of products, yes, not, <clears throat> no. okay. I mean, it was you know, on some level, glycolic new and improved because mm -hmm. there was tremendous technology that had, had uh, evolved during the set of the nineties, mm -hmm. you know, antioxidants, vitamin C, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, but again, remember the Alcon days, I put hyaluronic acid in all of these products back in the nineties. So these were way ahead of their time, but the same concept of simple, safe, synergistic, uh, system-oriented skincare for all, you know, I say anyone from eight to 108 who has skin. So mm -hmm. meaning for men, you know, teenagers, prepubescent. So mm -hmm. it is everyone needs to cleanse their skin. Everyone needs to exfoliate. Everyone needs to hydration balance and everyone needs to pr have protection. So mm -hmm. you know, the same concept, but it was a broader line, a larger line. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so Novita means, it's an Italian word to my uh, honor of my heritage. And it means new birth, new life, always something new. Wonderful. And it, and it was so fitting for skincare mm -hmm. and spa. Mm -hmm. And so my mantra has been, my tagline has been, Novita, new birth, new life, always something new. That's my promise. And so my job has been to really not only build teams because teams build your business, but also to look at the marketplace and see what was there, just like I did with, when I found glycolic acid, to see what was there and to add products, if it fit in the system, not just to glut the line, but to, you know, uh, if it really worked with it. So I built that line, and but the... Uh, I lived in Fort Worth, as I shared, and I had a warehouse. Uh, it had room in it to do classrooms. So I felt, because I'm a teacher by heart at you know, helping people grow and learn. 
And mm -hmm. I had identified that. And I did a lot of classes, a lot of workshops, keynote speaking at the uh, spa um, conferences. And so I felt I was going to do a uh, flagship spa in Fort Worth, kind of the training spa and do classes um, in the warehouse, you know, in our offices. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was about to do that when, and it's, this is in the book, but God had a different plan. And my daughter, Jill had moved to Austin and, but that it wasn't about Jill. It was about my mother-in-law, my dear mother-in-law mm -hmm. and who I divorced her son, who was an only child. And she said, I'm going to lose you too. And I said, no, you will never lose me. And so she and her husband were very, very instrumental, very close with my daughters and myself. And she now is in the mid range of Alzheimer's and they're living in Florida. They had retired. And I said to, I said to her husband a couple of years prior, now this would be 2001. I said, you know, you need help, buddy. And he said, no, no, I'm fine. But by 2004, he called me and he said, you're right. I do need help. And I felt that Austin, which was a smaller market than the big city of Dallas, Fort Worth, would be more conducive for them. And so I, um, they ended up moving to a little town outside of Austin called Georgetown, which is a bedroom community of Austin, Texas. And um, I knew also it was going to be a very difficult season and it was too much for my daughter to handle. Now in the early, um, to, uh, in the early 90s, when I was developing glycolique, remember I was so selling Jaguars and doing some <laughs> I also yeah. got my aesthetic license. Uh -huh. So, okay. And so, and because it was the demand of how to get it was so much smaller. I said, this is the time to do it. I could do it. It wasn't mm -hmm. virtual, but it was in a school that I could go at night and things mm -hmm. like that. So I did get my aesthetic license. So I pioneered again, the Novitas Spa in Georgetown, Texas by myself in one room in a hair salon here in Georgetown where I introduced myself and the products and the services that I had developed, that mm -hmm. I was teaching other spas, you know, to do mm -hmm. curriculums. And so I started um, the Novita Spa and in 2005 moved up to the historic Georgetown Square where I then scaled this business. So I started in one room, mm -hmm. went to three rooms and then a four, almost 4,000 square feet uh, spa which I built over the years to also be a medical spa. So I call it a hybrid. It looked like a luxury day spa, which it was clinical skincare, meaning result oriented. And then in 2012, 13, we added the medical component, laser hair removal, injectables, uh, and laser facials. Then in 15, cool sculpting, body contouring, and then I built, developed that along with um, then the products, of course, and then in uh, 2019, added regenerative stem cell therapy. And so that's a lot of information, mm -hmm. but, it, but it started small, one room, me, mm -hmm. and grew, okay? Yeah. So start, scale, sustain. Mm -hmm. And then, my friends, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And March comes... Well, and then as I shared earlier in the, our interview uh, that I launched the book, I wrote the book, I finished the book and uh, um, published it on Amazon December of uh, 19 and it went to number one, January 4th, which happens to be my mom's birthday. So mm -hmm. here is, so all of that has happened and we're getting ready for the year, doing marketing plans regenerative and other things. And I could see the handwriting on the wall by the, you know, early, certainly early March uh, was something I was closely watching. And then by in the next week, you know, people were canceling appointments and the next week, which was um, in the teens of March, I said to myself, I, I'm going to close before I'm told to close. Mm -hmm. because we had over a hundred people on the books for just the first two weeks of wow. the 
So I said, we had a meeting and I said, okay, ladies, we're going to, cause everyone's concerned. There's no, you know, they are aware of what's going on. And I just said, we're going to very strategically call our clients, not put in fear and just say, we're going to cancel your appointment. Cause at that point they were saying, you know, just for a couple of weeks. And so mm. we did that, uh, the canceling appointments through mid April and over, over a hundred appointments. Wow. And, and we, the last day we performed services was Saturday, the 21st of March. And then uh, Lauren, I, that night after, you know, kiss, kiss, hug, hug, uh, everyone, I sat there and I just prayed and I said, Father, what do I do? And I could just feel in my spirit, don't go dark, don't go dark. And the week before I had pulled in my warehouse, by the way, is in Dallas. So the same manufacturer that I've used for years, um, he uh, is in Dallas. So I, for many years had my own warehouse, but um, in probably in around 15, I, he started manufacturing then warehousing for me and then fulfilling because we do sell the products to salons and spas and do around the United States and, and medical spas. And we do do some exporting, but certainly the, the brick and mortar was the main avenue of uh, uh, sale. And of course our shopping cart on our website. So we didn't, I got a large order in from the warehouse that week. I just said, you know, if I'm I, uh, here by myself, I need product. And in April, I sold almost as much as we did in March. Wow. Being there every day, <clears throat> answering the mm. phone, and going online, uh, processing those orders. And as long as FedEx was open, I was open, meaning to ship. And of course, curbside, you know, things like that. But on March 31st, I was there, I just finished a live with my staff. We started doing lives uh, called the pop-up shop uh, because I needed to keep them engaged. We did Zoom calls three times a week. We started doing these uh, lives, you know, and Sarah in the bathroom putting lashes on and Gigi doing appeal and, you know, product mm -hmm. knowledge. And All right. Knowledge. And we started doing that. And I was there and I had just finished one of these. It was a Tuesday. And this guy walks up to the door and knocks on the door because the door is locked. And I opened the door and because people did come to the door to get, as I said, curbside product and or gift cards because birthdays and anniversaries still go on. Mm -hmm. So they, um, I opened the door and he said, he identified himself. And then he said, would you have any interest in uh, selling me your business? Wow. <laughs> And so I invited him in and he sat, you know, in that uh, chair over there and I sat in that chair over there and we just talked. And um, so that was March 31st, mid April, uh, we were honored with Austin Mag Women Magazine's Women's Way Award of a finalist oh, wow. for product innovation. Yes. Wow. So the one thing I said to this gentleman um, I'm not interested in selling my trade name nor the products because that's my baby. Mm -hmm. And he really yeah. wasn't interested in that either. Meaning he was interested in a what's called an asset purchase. He was interested mm -hmm. in the lease, the location, the goodwill, the database and the expensive equipment mm -hmm. and the staff. He was, he mm -hmm. was interested in all of that. Wow. Uh, because he had already purchased several other spas in the Austin market and he wanted sure. to brand with this one name. So oh, such a prayer. <laughs> I mean, who buys a brick and mortar business this year? Everyone's selling them. <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. That or closing right. down. I mean, it's possible you would have had to close down. Yes, possible. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Wow. Very much so. Yes. So it's it's truly God. It's truly getting mm -hmm. out of my own way and just being open. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I'm using the word God because that is my belief, but, but again, it's energy. It's, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
the secret, the book, the secret, on yeah. and on that things are, people are uh, aware of, meaning to put that intention out there. Now, my mm -hmm. intention was not to sell, but on mm -hmm. the other side of the coin, now this is an important piece. My mm -hmm. intention was not to sell, but what my intention was, and that's part of the book, because I was already working on the course that I'm launching at the end of uh, this year. That, I mean, yeah. in the next, I'm working on it again, but I was working on it last year. And, I, and while I was working on it, Lauren, I just got, got this strong sense, finish your book. Hmm. And the importance of that, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, in 2006, I remarried. Now I had not been married for 30 years and I had no intention of ever getting married again. But I met Paul Tyler and he was such a special person. And I knew in my spirit that it was something I was to do. Mm. Um, and he was a little bit older, but he was, he got me for the first time. Someone really got me, got my drive, my ambition, my spirit, my courage, my confidence. He got me and he enhanced that. And so it, it was a lovely season. But then in December of nine, he had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, it put, pushed him into what the neurologist said, a disease called Lewy body syndrome, mm -hmm. which is a Parkinson's form of dementia. So yeah. if you've ever had uh, anyone in your life with dementia, like my mother-in-law, that's bad mm -hmm. enough, but put Parkinson's in it, mm -hmm. OMG. My father has Lewy body. Oh. He's yeah. in frail care. Yeah. Very so nice. I know Lewy body very well. Uh -huh. Very, very, very difficult. Mm. And so uh, it was a very difficult season to hold on to a business. Now, this is, you know, 2010 and 11. But I, he had to go into frail care, as you mm -hmm. I love that term. Um, and not the whole time, but the latter part. And I <clears throat> vowed to myself, though, that when he was not walking, he would come home and pass away in our home. And so June of 11, he came home and he passed September 29th, 11. Sure. And he passed somewhere in the middle of the night. It was very dark. I was unaware of the time, but uh, I could not sleep after he had passed. So I just, you know, uh, was on the couch for a little bit. Then I went into the kitchen and made a cup of tea. And as it was dawning, the backyard was full of white butterflies, full. Wow. And I was like, wow. You know, am I hallucinating? I've got goosebumps. I was exhausted, but I was like, what are you trying to say to me? I put my head down on the kitchen table, which was tiled, it was cold. And I just had my head down there and I was just talking to God. And as I was raising my head, I could feel in my spirit, share your story. Mm. Well, I said, what story? tonight this story my life story well god doesn't answer those questions so from that point i started journaling now i wasn't at all clear on what level the story was because i have a long story but meaning many pieces as we're sharing some of them right now but in 17 i wrote an outline and the hope and possibilities phrase. I've been using that for years in my education with the skincare spa, meaning because with products that give you hope, there's infinite possibilities, you see? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I tied that to it. And once I put that to it, 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 the outline started to formulate, but I still didn't write it. So now we're in um, you know, the latter part of 19, and I just knew I needed to buckle down and finish this. And so I put the course aside, finished it, published it on um, Amazon. As I said, a friend of mine is in the, uh, that world, knows how to do that, you know, to get it on properly. Mm -hmm. And then it went to number one on January 4th. Wow. So, so with that, A, that story about Paul, but also I knew that I was heading into a new season. What mm. that season was, I was not sure, meaning that it was time to take all of this information, meaning share my story. 
what does that really mean? And so when the pandemic happened and I started crystallizing that, I mean, I had this time. So I did a new URL, megandemartino.com, a new <laughs> business Facebook page, Megan Demartino. And mm -hmm. so I started um, with that, Lauren, crystallizing this and knowing what I'm going to do, um, the, finish the course, which is a business course, million dollar business program to start, scale and sustain. But, <clears throat> and it's not a but about the course, but it's the course, it's coaching, it's consulting. Uh, it's putting all of this, these years of experience mm. to serve, to serve, to solve a problem, mm. serve a need. And mm -hmm. here is this pandemic and you know yourself mm. with what you personally know, the uncertainty is there mm. and what, you know, what will I do, so to speak? There are people that have had major career jobs that are mm -hmm. very squishy. They mm -hmm. may not have lost the job, but uh, the, mm -hmm. the whole industry is squishy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they're beginning to question, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm a master at going in and, and never, you know, analyzing, staying in front of the, the curve and looking at things and help to put it together and then, you know, start it, scale it and sustain it. Mm -hmm. So my heart is about your viewers. My heart is to help people to identify what their dreams, goals, and desires are. Because mm -hmm. it's often, starting is often in my experience, helping, working with people is often the more difficult piece because you have those self-doubts, you have those voices in your ear saying, oh, who am I? Why should I start a business? What should I do? You know, but as I said, it, today you can start a business with no capital or virtually mm -hmm. no capital, but you have to have clarity. You have to have clarity. And then you have to take that first step and the second and third step will be revealed to you. It's mm -hmm. step by step. You don't have to take monumental. That's why these podcasts like yours are such a blessing because it's helping people, interviewing people like myself, understand mm -hmm. that you don't have to be, you know, uh, and, and, and the secret is in the story or the, uh, the essence is in the story. Someone mm -hmm. said to me on uh, someone like yourself, and I'm not equating myself to Steve Jobs at all. So this is, you know, an addendum here. But someone said, oh, wow, it's kind of like Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. And her point, though, was it was a man, actually. He said, um, it's, it's, oh, no, it was a woman. She said, I was listening to Steve Jobs being interviewed. And, and her point was how when I launched the skincare, so there's two very key points to that. Skincare didn't, wasn't being marketed yet, but also spa wasn't, or skincare wasn't in salons yet. So her point about Steve Jobs was when he created the iPhone, they were like, who's going to use this thing? What is, what's this about? So he said, just wait, you'll see that this will be, you know, everyone will be using this. So it was understanding that market and the need of people and, mm. and creating that. So mm. that's one of my, if you want to say, you know, strengths is to help identify those things because starting is often the challenging piece. Mm -hmm. So, um, isn't your couldn't you add a fourth thing to your course? Because you've got um, so, sorry, start, scale, yeah. sustain, and maybe sell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because well, you've I sold twice, right. <laughs> or at least parts of it the second time. For sure, but yes, yes. And, uh, that actually is in it. But I don't say mm -hmm. it. I don't. It is. Yeah. It is a, a, a part of the course. Mm -hmm. But I don't say it because for two Not reasons. everyone's going to sell, I guess. That's right. And yeah. the other reason is selling should not be your uh, goal because the it's like Napoleon Hill says, burn the boats. You have to be more committed to the course at hand, the voyage. And, and if that happens, that's great. Because often, like you said, I sold the brick and mortar, I sold piece of it, but not the other piece 
that then because I'm going to, by the way, and we're working on this as we speak um, with the, so I sold the brick and mortar. So the Novitas Spa site, which I've had a URL since 98, that's being reworked as we speak because the spa services are coming off because I, I'm not doing those, <clears throat> but the shopping cart will be there and the course will be there. And it, that will be linked over to the Megan DiMartino site, but we're also working on an affiliate program. So I want to start something, it's called Curated Beauty. And I want to start something so people can, that I can help them build it virtually, you see? So, um, ah. okay. okay, so there's Correct. that piece. Yeah, so there's that piece to it as well. So in a, in a direct marketing company or program, you're not gonna sell that, I mean, at the end. So if you owned, the business then the potential of selling is there, but it should not be the end goal. I mean, mm -hmm. everything's for sale, but it mm -hmm. should be the journey. It should be building the business. Great and, point. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's about the passion that you're not gonna have that same passion of all you're thinking of is you're gonna sell the business one day. Exactly like right. you said, it's your baby. It's your baby. <laughs> Who wants to sell their baby? <laughs> but I also have the idea of the affiliate program and, you know, because that's becoming yeah. more common and the program is out there. So mm. it just made more sense because it fit yeah. with all these pieces, you know, to help people start, scale and sustain. So what will you sell with your affiliate program? Will it be your Navita Spa products or yes. the course or both? It can be both. Ah. But it's, it's, yeah. it can be both, but mm. it absolutely can and will be, but, but it is you know, from a structure, structure, you know, of, because the products are down the drain, you know, they're residual products. Mm. And, okay. I mean, the course will be evergreen, but the, but the uh, products, you know, you buy a cleanser, you need it in three months, you mm. need another one. Type of thing. Yeah, but affiliate programs work really well when you have a product that is not, doesn't have to be shipped because then it's so much easier to go global. Yes. With your, yeah. you know, you can, you can, as soon as you have a, a content product or a tech, you know, yes. what, what do they call it? Yeah. Um, oh, I can't think of the name, but anyway, it's your, your course is something that can go global really quickly. Right. Whereas getting yourself right. into every country with your products is a little harder. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. Like I said, and it would, that would be absolute. It would be much mm. more, the product piece would be more national here. Mm. I, even though I have exported over the years and I still do, it's mm -hmm. not the easiest thing to do for sure. Mm. But I think the word, or maybe this isn't the word you're looking for, but it's that immediate where mm. you have something that, you know, the order and it takes 10 days to get there, then that is a not immediate obviously yes those instant sale products really really work for affiliate marketing and for getting yes. affiliate marketers on board course, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. having said that the mm -hmm. ma the major market for all things that i've ever sold online via affiliate marketing is america so most of the people who are going to be buying on anybody's site anywhere in the world are going to be american <laughs> that's just because they consume most of the content online well that's what I found I mean I live here in little South Africa and mm -hmm. most of my audience is in America that's just how it is mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think many sites are like that unless you actually build a specific a site that is based on your country alone you mm -hmm. land up with a very big American audience unless you're really only trying to target your own country yes. Yeah. It, well, you said the key word. I mean, we're, this is a big space, you know, a lot of people. Yes. And yes. so a lot of, a lot of people that are interested in, in focusing on what you are uh, sharing. Yes. And a lot of people who are online, you know, okay. because not all of the little countries are as online <laughs> as Americans are. Yeah. Very, very true. I have a friend market. that lives in, in England and he, it's so strange. I'm, I'll say, well, can't you do no I don't have yeah. okay you know <laughs> it's interesting yeah right? we only just got fiber here in South Africa in the last few years so I mean our internet connection was horrendously bad and I don't know how the other countries sit with that but yeah it's it's taken us a while to catch up <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that is excellent 
Yeah, so that is an amazing story. And maybe now is a good time for you to talk about the gift that you want to offer the viewers, listeners and readers. Well, as uh, we've spoken about this throughout um, our time together, when and now the book you and I shared this with you and you said, well, I bought it on Kindle. But um, but in April, I said to myself, you know, I need to um, make this available to people to give people um, hope that, you know, it because I and the, then the story shares several very um, pivotal pandemics, so to speak, times in my life. And um, so I felt it was important because the other uh, line in the uh, title of the book is it's never too early or too late to create the life of your dreams. And I felt mm -hmm. that that was also a very important point because um, you know it matters not what my chronological, how many times around the sun I am, but it's about willing to start again, okay? And I want it, and there will be people that are going to be forced to look at this and, and, and start again. And change is actually very exciting. Change is a very important thing to own because if you get stuck in where you are, even if you were having, a, you know, life was rosy, you uh, often emotionally, you get stuck and don't, you know, you get stale and you don't look over the horizon. So I felt on so many levels, it was important to make this book available to people. So it's free for you on megandemartino.com. All I ask you to do before you download it, you come in and just your information. We will have a op-end uh, link down the road for um, um, a gift, a portion of the course, but I haven't uh, finished that yet. But today, my gift to you is the book, Hope and Possibilities Just Over the Horizon. It's never too early or too late to create the life of your dreams is free on megandimartino.com. That's absolutely wonderful, Megan. And there's one last thing we haven't spoken about is the amazing interviews you've been doing lately on your um, Facebook page, which is soon to become a podcast as well. Um, yes. So I will definitely add links um, at the bottom of the post and in the video, yeah, the video description and podcast description to, to those as well, because I've listened to a couple of those interviews and they're fantastic. Thank Some you. amazing people you've interviewed. And um, what is it called again? Unique Leaders. Unique Leaders Live. I love it's, that. Unique Leaders Live. Unique Leaders Live. It's all about you. Because I'm sharing with you today my story. But mm -hmm. I recognized and how it started. I've been doing Motivation Monday for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I've just recently changed that to Teach, Inspire, Motivate. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be about starting, scaling, and sustaining a business. So leading into mm -hmm. the course. But, but during the pandemic, I shared that about my staff and I said, I must keep engaged with these gals. And uh, so we started, as I shared, doing Zoom calls three times a week. And then I mm -hmm. said to them, let's go live. And we started that. And our, our um, client base really very much enjoyed it. And people, you know, there was a strong response. But one day around Easter, um, I um, was uh, on Facebook and a friend of mine who has an amazing story herself um, about her son's health, but and it, regardless, she's a videographer and very, very talented woman. She posted on Facebook that she was starting a directory with alternative medical professionals for, you know, that. And I messaged her and I said, would you like to... Um, would you want to come on and, you know, share about that? And she said, oh, I would love to. And it, Unique Leaders had no name. She just came on. And I realized then that, like you're doing with me, it's, it's about their story. And people mm -hmm. truly, truly get so much from their story. Mm -hmm. And so I want people, and I guide them, to go back to the beginning because many podcasts, and I'm sure you would agree with this, um, take 
let's say today is what you're doing and stay focused on that. Mm -hmm. And don't really help the audience to understand that you didn't just happen. Exactly. Yeah. Years and years of the backstory. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's all about you because it's really their story is about them, but it's not just today. And often with people, uh, they'll jump, you know, I'll introduce them and then they'll start, you know, I'll ask about, I'll say, tell us about young so-and-so and what, you know, your um, dreams were back then or whatever I share with, uh, ask the person, but then they'll say something small and then jump to today, like marketing themselves. And I'll say, well, let's go back to, you know, and like you just shared, they have been amazing with things that people have shared and um, things that, I mean, I don't know all these people well, but I know a little bit about them and things that they share that have truly been um, beneficial for the audience. Uh, You're actually helping people write their story in a yeah. way. You know, if they haven't ever gone and sat and gone back to all of those parts of themselves, it's amazing. Definitely. Yeah. And I loved your book. Your book is fantastic. And I hope that everybody downloads it and reads it. And maybe we can get some great reviews going. It would be absolutely stunning. And it's then, been. And then I just want to say, and contact me, yeah. meaning that yes. in the comments, what, you mm -hmm. know, if you need some help, if you would like a discovery call, mm -hmm. if you, um, mm -hmm. you know, are interested in that type of thing and that, but make sure you put, you know, uh, that you're interested in the course and we will send you information on them when it's available. Fantastic. Yes. And I can also please give me that when it is available and I will add it um, as an update to your article. That would be great. Yeah, looking forward to that and looking forward to all the new ways that you are recreating and reinventing yourself. And in one of the interviews that I listened to that you did um, with a lady who was in Yugoslavia, not Yugoslavia, somewhere there. She was stunning. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was absolutely amazing interview. And um, you talked about being an adventurer and how, you know, that spirit of adventure. And I absolutely love that about you. You have an amazing spirit of adventure. You just completely, you know, you're happy to reinvent yourself over and over again. And I, I just commend you for that. It's been a Thank real you. honor to speak to you and get to know you and your story and read your book as well. It's been great. Thank you. So and, thank and you so much for your time. And sooner than later, I'd love to have you on awesome. Unique Leaders Live to share your story. Oh, because thank you. Thank you, Megan. That'll be wonderful. I'll let you know when I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm also reinventing myself all the time. <laughs> you let me know. Let me okay. Know. Thank wonderful. you, everyone, for joining Lauren and I today. It was a truly an honor. Yeah, thank you. It has been an absolute honor from my side as well. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> Be blessed.